Good morning. Thank Good morning. you all for waking up early, I suppose, and for coming. Mike and Christy and all the Friday morning meetup. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. So as Mike said, I'm with Wavemaker 360 Health. It's a new venture fund about a mile north east of here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. My real goal in life here is to talk as little as possible so we really maximize time for a QA and a because having sat out there for 33 of the 34 startups, I tend to get a lot more value when questions are being asked and responses are being given versus just sort of talking up here. So that's, that's the plan. Um, to start though, just to kind of give me some orientation, by, by raise of hands, how many people out here are, have been, are with, or expect to be in the near future with some kind of an early stage company, a startup, something like that? All right, good, good. I'll work that in. Um, and then I guess same question around healthcare, because I'll inevitably end up talking a little bit about healthcare. Uh, how much of this room is in or working with adjacent to uh, healthcare? Should have, should have had you guys use two different hands and see who, who was both. Um, okay. Well, as Mike said, I've, I've worked with a lot of early stage companies. Um, I went back and checked. I started to copy down logos and that got ridiculous. Um, I've worked with 33, I think, early stage companies, almost never as the founder of the company, almost always brought in by the founder or founding team to help the company get to whatever the next level is. I've joined early stage companies when they're five minutes old. I've, worked, I've joined early stage companies when they're about five years old. Um, the issue always being the same, the founding team got to whatever point it could get on its own and then you bring in outside expertise, horsepower, um, new thinking, whatever the case may be. I've had a whole bunch of different roles. About half of the time I've worked in the company in an operating role as a, I guess, regular employee. And then about half the time I've been an advisor or a consultant to the company. Um, I've done this, I'll cheat here and grab a few of these notes. I've done this for a bunch of different industries. Um, these logos and other logos um, in healthcare, sports, uh, technology, of course. I did a fashion startup, hospitality. I did a death care industry startup, which was a whole talk in and of itself. If you have ever spent any time in the six feet under type of industry, uh, consumer products, education, food, transportation. Um, most of the startups have been what I think the room would consider to be a classic startup, kind of the in the garage thing where the company's getting off the ground in a scrappy way and then it, and then it uh, lucks into some funding and then some more funding and hopefully it becomes big. And then a few of the times I've been involved in startups that were embedded inside big corporations. So you see uh, Disney and ESPN as an example. Um, I, I went to work for a startup right after uh, the Walt Disney Company acquired ESPN and did, in essence, an ESPN startup, but inside the mouse uh, where my funding, instead of being a venture capitalist or an angel investor was uh, the Walt Disney Company. And I've done that for Disney. I did that for a big company in Russia. A uh, big company in London. So I've had a few odd startups of the 33 that were uh, entrepreneurial as opposed to entrepreneurial. Um, and most of the time I work with the, most of the time with these 33 companies, I've worked and I've been hired by the founders of the entrepreneurs. And once in a while, and in kind of not so pleasant circumstances, I'm brought in by the investors when they're dissatisfied with the founding team. And they're doing the same work, but in one case I'm kind of welcome, and in the other case I'm not so welcome. Um, <laughs> but that's been, that's been the, the thumbnail on these 33 startups that I've been involved with going back for about 25 years. Kind of reflecting on that, for this talk at least, which was which was cool for Mike to come up with the, the theme for the conversation because it forced me to, forced me or maybe gave me an opportunity to reflect on some of what the common denominators were of all these startups. And it 
was probably as simple as the two things here on the page. Almost all of these startups, the reason I was brought on is to help the company develop its go-to-market strategy, which means a million different things from a million different companies. Um, and importantly, at least in my case, I can't think of a time where I've developed this startup the go-to-market strategy and then walked away. Instead, what I do is work on the go-to-market strategy and then stick around to execute it. Be the guy that you know takes the company to a trade show or starts to go on the road and sell, recruit, whatever the commercialization strategy is all about. It's one thing to just put something pretty together on a PowerPoint. It's another thing to kind of stick around and actually execute that plan. So I strive to do as much execution as I do strategy. And then on the right side here is fundraising. A couple of the companies that I've worked with have been beautifully, wonderfully, magically funded, but probably 29 of the 33 have needed fundraising. So I've spent a lot of time Prior to becoming a venture capitalist, working with companies on their fundraising strategy, raised money from angels, high net worth individuals, celebrities, venture capitalists, um, raised money from different countries, um, who have I left out, family offices. Uh, I did a crowdsourcing or crowdfunding campaign for one startup. So I've, I've raised money from or turned over, I'm not even necessarily going to take credit for successfully raising, but definitely turned over every possible investor rock that can be turned over in pursuit of raising money for most of the 33 companies. And what I really did across these 33 companies is fail a lot because that's how you learn and that's probably the best segue into the title of this talk, which is um, what, what working with 33 different early stage companies prepared me for the venture capital thing. Um, and this is, this I actually scribbled down when I saw the movie, but then thankfully they've got these screenshots up on the internet, I was able to grab one, but this does really summarize, I think, what more than anything else I've done over the last 25 years and across 33 companies, I tell people all the time, um, when I go to work with them, you're, they wanna know about your successes, which is great, but I tell them, you're really, you're really paying someone like me for the failures, because the one thing I've done is make a lot of failures, or done a lot of failures, but what I hope I haven't done is I haven't failed in the same way twice, so, um, somebody else paid for the past failures. You won't get. You won't have to be. You won't have to uh, be charged for those. I'll just make some new mistakes on your behalf. <laughs> um, so number thirty-four was a uh, venture fund. We opened officially on May first of this year, meaning we called capital. We of course spent a lot of time, about seventeen months leading up to that, raising the capital that we could invest in startups. Um, Wavemaker 360 Health is a joint venture between a, an 11 year old healthcare consultancy here in town in Pasadena and if you know Wavemaker proper in Santa Monica which has been around run by Eric Monlunas it's been around for 12 or 14 years via Eric um, and it's a collaboration between the two firms. It's run by myself and the other general partner in the fund here in Pasadena. It's got Wavemaker's name on it. They're also our biggest LP. And we, as the health indicates, we invest in healthcare companies and we, we define that for the sake of our fund as everything in healthcare minus uh, early stage companies that are involved in clinical trials. So we rule out for not for better or for worse, uh, not to say not good business models, but we rule out biotech and we rule out what I would say are inside the body medical devices. Just by virtue of the longer clinical trials, we think that's a good sport, just a different sport, and we think there's far more venture funds th from Santa Barbara down to San Diego that do a good job with early stage investing in bioscience. So we took, we said to ourselves, let's take healthcare minus that. So those are the Whatever is left in healthcare, which is a lot, is what we look at. We do seed and Series A investing. And the thesis of the fund is all around value based health. So it's cool that healthcare is a big industry. It's cool that it's maybe getting bigger because the boomers are uh, it sort of the top of that bell-shaped curve, I think I read, or no, I had an entrepreneur in the office the other day that quizzed me and asked, you know, how many 
how many people turn 65 today in the United States? And I didn't know the answer. And I assume he's right. And he said 10,000 people turn 60. This is just a few weeks ago, so data can't have changed much. 10,000 people turn 65 today, which means 10,000 people turn 65 yesterday, and 10,000 people turn 65 the day before or the next day. Um, point being is if you're in your healthcare and you kind of start to consume more healthcare at or around the age of 65, uh, pretty good bet the industry is going to continue to get bigger, regardless of politics and everything else. Um, but that's not what drove us. That's not what our purpose was in starting the fund. What we cared a, a lot about, um, spent, spent much of that 17 months crystallizing our story around before we actually launched the fund was this buzz, let's see, um, can't find it, the buzz concept of value-based health. So from our point of view, about 40 years ago, just my my understanding of the, of the history books around healthcare, I was not studying this too much at age, but um, 40 years ago, the healthcare industry in America transitioned from being cost or cost plus to what we now have lived with for most of our lives here in this room, which is fee for service healthcare. That's where we get that CPT code and that explanation of benefits. And we fundamentally, almost all of the time, pay for our healthcare as a unit of service. And that's a $3 trillion industry, and that's what's going away faster here on the West Coast, slowest in the Midwest and the East Coast is somewhere in between, being being transitioned into value-based healthcare or value-based payments. And that used to be kind of a not so understood concept, but now that's, and it, we used to give talks on this to help people understand why, why and where the industry was going vis-a-vis value-based health. Um, the simplest way I know to explain it is over the last 40 years, if you were the CEO of a hospital in America, if you were the most financially successful CEO of a hospital in America, that meant you had all your beds full and you had a line out the door. You were paid for volume. The best way you could make money is to fill your hospital and your hospital's beds with patients. The most financially successful CEO 10 or 20 years from now will be the CEO that goes to his hospital and has nobody in it. You're not, you have been paid to put people in hospitals. That's what the healthcare system incentivized. Going forward, we will, we will incentivize and reward the system for keeping you out of the hospital. So that makes things like patient education and engagement and population health and all these concepts and buzzwords that we're hearing, it makes them commercially viable in a way that even if the product or technology or service was around 10, 15 years ago, there's no business model that can really support it. Um, my favorite example is a device that has been around for 142 years, and it's just now starting to be commercialized inside the healthcare system, uh, the telephone via telemedicine. It's not new, we've had the phone since, uh, I had to look it up 142 years ago, but now telemedicine's got a fighting chance to succeed because there's business models out there that allow the various stakeholders to actually make money implementing telemedicine. So lots and lots and lots of examples of interesting um, technologies, interesting products, interesting services that have a fighting chance to be commercially successful. Doesn't mean they all will be in a way that couldn't have happened 10 years ago because if you didn't have that almighty CPT code or some way to be some way to charge as a unit of service, it was very hard to make money in, in sort of healthcare entrepreneurship. Hang on a quick second. And of course all of this equ equates to a ton of disruption. So you've got a massive industry, $3 trillion industry, 18% of GDP. Um, and you've got an industry, I, I was at a, a Draper event up in the Silicon Valley a few months ago, and the first guy that got up on stage reminded the audience, which was very international, so it was a, it was a cool perspective to have. And he said, look, you know, we, we in this room, meaning the, the, the we that are living in the US, read about and have almost been educated since an early age of how out of control our healthcare spend is in the United States. And we're, today we're at 18 plus percent of GDP. So we're the, we're the poster child for out of control healthcare spending as a country. 
but that doesn't mean that all the other first world countries are happy. They're just a little lower than us, but they're equally unhappy at 11% or 13% or 16% and, and, and climbing. If you think about this from a national perspective, that number can't just keep going up forever. We gotta have some money to educate people. We gotta have some money to, fi some money to fix potholes on the streets. We have to have some money to do other things as a country. So we have to at some point get the healthcare spend under control and value-based health I think is one of the five or six things that are thrown around in the salad bowl to get healthcare under control from a from a national standpoint. And of course, if you if you think about entrepreneurship, if you take a step back and you think about what entrepreneurs do, what entrepreneurship is all about, they thrive on disruption. There's gonna be a lot of disruption across a three trillion dollar business. I think we're gonna look back in ten years and say this is maybe the golden era of positive disruption in the healthcare industry that the science side stuff has always happened. It's happening now, it will continue to happen. But more on the business side of healthcare, there's a lot of things that are happening that are positive that give our healthcare system a chance to reform, transform. And I don't think the big companies are the ones that are gonna do this. I think it's gonna be the entrepreneurial startups that are taking a little bite here and a little bite there, all of which are being done in the name of kind of fixing the healthcare system. So I guess reworded the title of this talk is how did how did 33 year 33 startups 25 years of working with all these early stage companies prepare me for the venture capital thing which in many ways started for me just five months ago worked with a lot of venture capitalists always on the other side of the table and then one day woke up and became one so from my from my point of view the the thought I had as I translated, and, and again, thanks to Mike for forcing me to think a little bit about this, but the thought I had was, what have I been doing for these early stage companies? Because in many regards, the venture fund is just another startup. Um, it's different, certainly. Um, what I do day in and day out is different than when I work for an operating company. But I really looked at what I thought venture funds needed to be good at. So it seemed to me, seemed to me a year ago, it definitely seems to me now that I've met with 100, 100 different early stage companies the last four or five months, that an early stage, that a venture fund needs to be good at attracting good quality startups. I wanna meet with the cream of the crop and the best companies. After all, I'm, I'm paid to return, I'm paid to return, uh, make a financial return to the investors that come into the fund. So I need to, if I attract the best of the best companies in the first place, then even if I just flip a coin and decide who to invest in, I'm better off than if I'm just taking any old startup, taking meetings with any old startup. So I want to attract really good companies. I want to be as good at, as I possibly can at picking the companies that we invest in. So we've got, as of yesterday, I'd met with 96 companies in the last five months and we've invested in seven. So I need to be, somehow, some way, I need to be a good picker of companies. And then the last thing that I think any venture fund needs to be good at is supporting the venture supporting the uh, portfolio companies that we actually invest in. Um, so we did that, and this goes back to what I think I learned. We did that and found one common denominator that would help us attract, pick, and support the early stage companies. And it's ended up, it was a giant pain in the ass. It was, uh, took a, it, made, it, it made the fundraising that we did take a lot longer but we went out and got mostly individual investors. Um, Wavemaker is our only institutional LP. The rest of the LPs in our fund, and we're up to about 60 now, are individuals. And we did something that was a little controversial at the beginning, because we knew it would take more time. We brought in almost all of those 59 other investors, our healthcare executives. So we kind of just went door to door and, and met with tons and tons of healthcare executives across probably every pocket of healthcare here in the United States, introducing the fund um, and inviting them to become a small, medium, or, or large LP in the fund. And it was brutally unsuccessful at the beginning, and then we got a few, and then we got a few more, and then we got to about a $5 million fund and 10 LPs. 
and then we almost overnight went from 10 to 60 uh, LPs. Our LPs are in our hospitalists, their clinicians, their med device, they are uh, long-term care, home health. Uh, we've got uh, somebody who's the CEO of the first or second, depending on the year, largest M&A firm that only does M&A work on the healthcare side. We have people in the big uh, university hospitals and research hospitals. Um, and that worked out to be really, that, that ended up being really helpful for us. And kind of here's why. So I quickly realized, as I'm doing right now, don't really talk about me, don't talk about our, my other uh, co-general partner who's got fantastic healthcare credentials. Talk about our LPs. Um, and as the word has gotten out that we have this LP base, the early stage companies that are finding us that we're attracting are incredible. We're getting into deals that just to be as blunt as I can be with the audience here, we're getting into deals that we wouldn't normally get into. We're a $25 million fund, and the other VCs that are that are circling these opportunities are $250 million funds on up. And at the beginning, we would ask the entrepreneurs, well, why are you even talking to us? If I was you, I wouldn't be talking to a $25 million fund. Why would you not, if Andreessen Horowitz is talking to you, that's where you take your money. It's just big, bigger, they can write a bigger check now, and they'll definitely be able to write a bigger check down the road. The answer is they're talking to us because of our LPs. They know that we've done a good job letting the world know that we have these 59 LPs, almost all of whom are healthcare executives, and events like this have done a good job over time making it clear that money, especially with the economy being what it is today, is not the most important variable. The smartness of that money, the strategic value of that money is what's important. So we do really well on that front. Our LPs also help us pick companies. I've been able to, uh, as part of the due diligence process, I've been able to enlist the help of one or more of these 59 individuals and say, hey, we're investing in a uh, company in the neonatology space, and I don't know how to spell neonatology, but I've got two <laughs> LPs that do, um, one of whom got in his car and went down to a children's hospital and did a sales call with the founder of this company that he facilitated, and we got to sit in and listen in on a sales call between a founder and the decision makers at a children's hospital. Um, the founder got a sales call we wouldn't have gotten, and we got to be a fly on the wall and see how the founder interacted with the tough questions that were coming out of the neonatology operation of the children's hospital. So they help us pick our companies, um, and of course, they help us support our companies once we make investments, and they sit on the board. We had a, 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 for, a former chief medical officer of Optum, um, who's now on the board of a five, a company with a five million dollar valuation. Um, that company couldn't have, in a million years, even gotten a phone call with this particular individual, um, and he's now on their board. So we're, we think we're exceptionally good at supporting these companies beyond what just two general partners can do, which is great for me to say, oh, I'll invest in you and I'll help you forever and ever and ever, but then I'll get super busy and I don't scale and a two person venture capital fund doesn't scale very well, but with 59 and growing LPs, we have the ability to support our companies in ways that others don't. So quickly, because I think I'm down to just the last few minutes, um, transition, because I know these talks always have to have a little bit about um, what advice do VCs give uh, people in the audience that are looking for funding. So I'm gonna do that really quickly. I'm gonna start with a grain of salt, because I firmly believe that across 33 companies that I've worked with, if one thing is true, if you, present your business plan to 20 VCs, you will get 20 different pieces of advice. Um, there seems to be just no rhyme or reason. I, I learned the hard way until I get, until I hear the same thing three times in a row by three different VCs, I don't change my, my presentation, I don't change my talk. Um, we all love to have our opinions and um, so listen for that, but don't, but take what I'm saying and take what other VCs and other investors say with a grain of salt because it could just be a one man's opinion, one, one woman's opinion and it may not be representative. So I'm gonna try my best to come up with things that I'm pretty sure are universally true, regardless of who you're uh, meeting with. The first one is when you come in and talk to us, this is very pedantic, don't ask me or don't let me talk about myself or my firm. I'm only gonna regurgitate what's, what's on our website and on LinkedIn, and I'm gonna waste 10 or 12% of your time. You're getting 45 minutes, 
And it used to, I figured this out the hard way, but why spend any of those minutes having me tell you what is already on my website? You've just wasted a precious amount of those 45 minutes and you always need that time at the end of the presentation to walk into that room and tell me, look, I already know everything about you. If there's something really on your mind, ask me, but there's no reason to spend the first four or five, six minutes of a presentation having me tell you almost word for word what's on my website. Um, I, I think that's universally good advice. The other thing, and I, and I have four of these by the way, so the other thing is, and I sort of can't believe we're still talking about this because I think I did my first PowerPoint presentation 21 years ago, but your PowerPoint presentation shouldn't suck. Um, and way too often they do. Um, so two things on that. First, um, sort of a sub tip on this, Put your PowerPoint present, get, get a projector, it doesn't have to be a fancy one like this, but get a projector that projects onto a dry, that projects onto a wall. Make that wall a dry erase board. Run your presentation through a group of people that don't know anything about your business. You've got it on a dry erase board. This is my favorite uh, way to quickly improve your PowerPoint presentation. You've got it on a dry erase board. Take dry erase markers, mark it up based on feedback you're getting on the dry erase board, take a picture with your phone, and then go back. You're sort of editing it quickly as opposed to editing slowly in the, in the PowerPoint presentation. It's a really fast way to improve your, your presentation. And the reason this is so important is it's really the only thing you can control. You can't control if I'm in a good mood or a bad mood, what thing I'm looking to invest in, how busy I'm in, what any, what any entrepreneur doesn't know about my week this week as we invested in three companies. You couldn't have known that. So you're not gonna get my attention no matter what, but your PowerPoint presentation, you can control the destiny. Have, you, can tr you can control your destiny on that. Have that be good. Force yourself to spend the time. And one other tip, by, let me go back to show of hands. Who in this room is a graphic designer? So find those people because <laughs> you don't have to do this yourself. And if you're not good at PowerPoint, which this is not a good PowerPoint presentation, by the way, but I had to do it quickly last night, um, find somebody that is. Make it look sharp. Don't go to an important investor with a substandard work product. Uh, number three, remember, especially this is a comment more around seed and, and, er, and small Series A investing. Remember, later on, the game is played much differently. We look at real financials. You've been in business for three or four years. You've been generating revenue. You've proven the fit between the product and the market. You know what the customer acquisition costs are. You know what the lifetime value of the customer is. You know all that cool, hard data stuff. And it's really easy to make investment decisions for the VCs when they're doing Series B and C. It's just, it's just sterile. It's, it's, it's financials. At the early stage, seed and, and smaller Series A, we don't have much to look at. Half the companies I look at are pre-revenue, and those that are rev in revenue have been in revenue for weeks or months, but certainly not years. But it doesn't mean psychologically I'm not craving something that you're going to tell me that proves there's a paying customer out there for what you want. You may not have that paying customer, but find something. Do a survey. Um, find something that's comparable in another industry. Um, do a pilot, even if unpaid. Come in there with something that helps me know there's a fit between your product and your market. If you've been in business for a little while, it gets easier, but again, half the conversations I have, you haven't been, so you have to come up with something that appeal, that, that taps into that psychology that says, I still wanna know there's a fit between the product and the market. And then lastly, uh, storytelling. Get don't be good at telling the story of your business. Be great at it. Um, meetings, with, meetings with investors are hard fought. Be really good at telling your story. I, I did this talk once for more of a Hollywood situation, and we were kind of or, organically as part of the conversation, we were reminding ourselves, we live in Hollywood. There's plenty of good storytellers in here. If you're working on your, on your slide deck to present to investors, Get some, if you're not a good storyteller or you don't feel like reading a book on how to become a good storyteller, find somebody that is and help them make that memorable. I saw, I saw 23 companies this week. So, and, not, and all of us see 23 companies every week, plus or minus. So remember that you've got to do something that is as passionate as you are about your startup. I have to be able to remember it the next day or the next week. And your first 45 minutes with me is a smart way to get me to know that, and a lot of it is just about storytelling. So don't don't uh, underspend your time around that particular dimension of preparing. And that is it.
I uh, thank you all for coming and looking forward to answering some questions and we'll see you next time. Hey guys, thank you so much for an amazing Absolutely. presentation. I really enjoyed that last bit. It's really important for us to understand as, as entrepreneurs and startups uh, where the VC actually fits in with the startup organization. Um, and a lot of people are interested in acquiring money and maybe VCs are, are, are a good fit in the future or maybe it's a good fit right now. But you also said that you do, and I'm sure someone's gonna ask a question about this later, you do help with seed funding as well. Yeah, yeah, we mostly do seed. Okay. We'll do smaller, as a $25 million fund, we'll do small Series A. Gotcha. But if somebody's looking to raise $10 million with a $25 million fund, that's not gonna be the place that we get too excited. That said, we've written some very small checks percentage-wise as into big into bigger investments, but mostly we're looking for traditional seed, whatever the heck traditional seed means these days. Okay, <laughs> very good. We're gonna open up to questions and answers now. John, we'll uh, walk around with the mic. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Please save comments and storytelling for offline. I'm sure Jay's gonna hang out with us if you have more um, comments or stories or experiences that you'd like to share with him. Thanks. Hi, thank you so much for this. You early on said in terms of your mandate for healthcare that it doesn't include certain um, areas. But I wanna ask about the broader ar array in which it could include. Is it also inclusive of wellness or you know, like meditation apps or things that could loosely fall under the rubric of healthcare but also done traditionally? Yeah, for, well, for our fund, absolutely. So I, we're pretty, with the exception of things that involve clinical trials, we're extremely generous or liberal, I'm not sure what the right adjective is, around what we define as healthcare. And even extending that question a little bit further, we'll look at companies for whom their primary market is healthcare, but hey, that thing that they, that problem they've just solved for, we're working with a company that works with hospitals to reduce hospital acquired infection. That's a classic healthcare problem and perfectly fits our thesis. Once they get a little bit further out the road, they can go work with the cruise ship industry that seems to always be having a problem with uh, infection problems on the, on the big cruise ships. A Little bit more adjacent to, but still fit. So yes and yes. Question, Jay. I think you were uh, at the beginning said you were gonna talk about why you're located here in Pasadena. Uh, was that like a strategic, strategic decision, decision or was it because you're working out of a bedroom or a garage or <laughs> as a startup? Um, my partner and I, so my partner is John Knackle. Some of you may, may know him. He's been in Pasadena for 25 years. We met at a inside uh, company down on Raymond actually. Uh, we worked for four years on a Caltech spin out. Um, so when we came together to form this, having had our previous experience working together in an operating role with this startup, um, be Pasadena based, it seemed like the right thing to do. And we both live in or very near Pasadena. So that's probably the more honest answer. <laughs> So how, how do companies find you? How do small startups find you? Well, 59 of our LPs are out there getting pitched all the time. So I think probably half of those 59 LPs invest in our fund just to get entrepreneurs off their back. When they hear all their pitches, they just say, I, I, don't, I don't invest my own money anymore. I do it all through Wavemaker 360 Health. So we get a lot of deal flow through our individual investors. We get deal flow from Wave maker proper in Santa Monica who doesn't do hardly any healthcare investing. So when any when any of you healthcare entrepreneurs find Wave maker proper or Eric Monlunis's team, he's going to turn you over to me because we do work their healthcare their healthcare fund. Um, and then it's a lot of stuff like this. We're just you know we've, we've been at it since May first, so we do as many talks as we can and let the world fully know that we're in business. We proactively look for companies here in Southern California, but there's nothing in our mandate that says we can't invest elsewhere in California, elsewhere in the United States, or elsewhere in the world. So we're looking at companies as, I think, as far away as New Zealand right now. Um, 
But I, I, I don't think there's a match venture. I think companies find us the same way they find any other venture fund, at least today. Okay, so I'm a real newbie, retired and failed retirement out of Boeing, and went the other rats <laughs> and went into venture capital and startup company. So you said to don't put anything on your PowerPoint charts; it's on the web already. And at the end, you talked about your story. Could you briefly define for me the difference between what you put on your PowerPoint or what's on the website versus what your story is when you're presenting? Well. So I think my I think if I'm understanding your question in that part of my talk, what, what I was getting at is as the entrepreneur coming in and talking to me, what the point I was trying to make with that guy, is that the slide you're talking about? Is you get about 45 minutes with me or any investor typically, that's our at least for a first meeting, that's our attention span. And it seems to me I, I can remember going into Sequoia. Just, to, just not to pick on Sequoia, but just because it was memorable. Flew up to Sequoia for one meeting. It was a company that was pretty cash strapped, so even getting on the Southwest Airlines is kind of a big deal for the company. It was more money that we wanted to spend. We probably shouldn't have been talking to Sequoia in the first place. It was a 45 minute meeting, and we spent 11 minutes with the guy that I was meeting with, having him tell me about Sequoia. Like, there was just no reason to spend those 11 minutes. So the point was, is walk into that room and get right do the talking. It's not that's not a time for you to do a lot of listening. You could have already learned. I, I already knew everything I needed to know about the venture capitalists that I was meeting from in Sequoia. I already knew everything about Sequoia. It's not hard to find information out about a venture fund like that. Um, so spend the full forty five minutes talking about your company. Don't let me talk about myself. That's the point I'm trying to make. And too many of these forty five minute conversations, the entrepreneur comes in. And they almost feel like they have to start the meeting by saying, "Tell me about yourself, Jay. Tell me about your fund." Don't do it. You need all 45 minutes. At the end, we're always rushed. I'm always, I've always got another meeting coming in. Use all 45 minutes. It's not what you're trained to do anywhere else in life. You're, we're, all, we're all trained to listen more, but not in the first 45 minute presentation. Do all the talking. Let me do all the listening. Let me ask questions. Let me spend all 45 minutes learning about you. You don't need to learn about me in, those, in that first meeting. I need to learn about you, and those minutes count. That's, that's sort of the point I'm trying to make with this. Uh, the have you made investments so far? Yeah, seven investments. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those companies? Yeah, um, so a, a neonatology company um, that I'm trying to find the TechStars guy that is a TechStars company um, that is solving a problem with that parents of prematurely born babies have. You spend your first few weeks or months of your baby's life living in the NICU, not getting a whole lot of information other than when the nurse shift change happens. And then the new nurse comes in, updates you, and then for 12 hours, you don't really get any information about how your little baby is doing, and you had no idea that you were gonna have a prematurely born baby and your world is rocked, and this company has come out with a platform that takes all the wonderful data that the EMR system has, makes it parent-friendly, and presents it to the parent on an app so they have a clue what's going on with their baby and therefore are more engaged. And there's a lot of data that says the more engaged mom and dad are while their baby is in the NICU, the better the health health outcomes and the faster the baby goes home and the less likely it is that the baby comes back. Um, that company is called Nicolette. We invested in another company, and I'll, I'll try to go chronologically because it's, it's fun to do it that way. We invested in another company that takes a couple years, a couple year jump, and they are a wearable, a health wearable, but the market segment that they went after is the only market that's really not being paid attention to. So we spent a lot of time worrying about prematurely born babies and infants. And then we spent a lot of time once we're adults all the way to seniors tracking health data, but nobody really pays attention to that three to 10 year old segment. So this company came up with a wearable that the three to 10 year old puts on his or her wrist. Of course, it's cute. It's got butterflies and robots and dinosaurs. And the kids wear it around. If they're a healthy kid, it might just be for mom to have peace of mind. And if they're an un unhealthy kid, asthma would be a perfect use case. It's tracking currently four different vitals. It's sending that information to mom. It's sending that information to the um, primary care or pediatrician. And interestingly, it's sending that information to perhaps the most valuable user of that information, which is the health insurance company or the life insurance company. And they're getting data around the life of kids between the ages of three and ten that nobody's ever had. It's kind of a blind spot in healthcare. Um, 
I'll do one more. Um, invest in one of our favorite problems in healthcare, just because it's supremely simple. You can go to any, I'll, who, uh, who I pick on it won't get upset, but we'll pick on Huntington. You go to any hospital website and you'd be shocked to see how many nurses they're hiring for. You know, typical, typical hospital is hiring, has 376 nurse openings at any one time, which makes you think, why would you possibly go there if, there, if they need 376 <laughs> nurses? Then there's not a lot of nurses there, but it's a constant problem getting worse and worse. We typically import our way out of this problem, but we have immigration issues today that we didn't used to have. Um, nurses are the front line of all healthcare, of course. So we're working with a company up in Northern California, actually two different companies, but the one I'm talking about right now is up in Northern California that's, solved, that's helping hospitals solve the nursing shortage by creating a marketplace between hospitals and nurses, and in particular, travel nurses. That's a niche way that hospitals are increasingly solving this problem with these 13-week contracts. There's a lot of nurses that like to see the world or at least see the country, and they go from 13-week contract to 13-week contract working for different hospitals. So if you're a hospital, especially in a hospital in a part of the world that people like to visit and hang out in for 13 weeks before going to the next hospital, it's an interesting way to fill a percentage of your hospital openings, and these guys have opened up shop to specialize in that travel nurse segment. All of these are pretty representative of the kind of companies that we look for that are, you know, by definition, we're not funding companies that solve cancer. We're, solving com we're funding companies that solve interesting, defined niches within the healthcare, I don't want to say healthcare business landscape, because we do invest in some companies that are more clinical. Um, but they tend to solve very specific problems that can be business quantified within healthcare. Okay. So I imagine you hear a lot of stories, you hear a lot of problems that are in healthcare. So I was wondering if you've heard about something where you see there's probably a great opportunity and a great need, and you're just waiting to hear for a company that's <laughs> going to come up with a great idea to solve it. I think I get the question. <laughs> um, so I think one of my, one of the best answers I can give to that, we were, we were talking about earlier before the presentation started, but the, perhaps the neatest thing that's going on within healthcare, this is, this, the following, I'll, I'll give credit to an entrepreneur that was in my office about two months ago. And uh, he brought his team and you know, he got to the slide in his deck that showed me his revenue growth. He, he was in revenue, so it was a later C, early A, Series A type of investment opportunity. But what was cool about this particular presentation is the company had been around for maybe four years, certainly three years. And so he's showing me the, you know, the typical revenue graph and it was just really flat. You know, maybe maybe increasing sales, but just barely for most of the last three years. And then all of a sudden, his, in the last six months, I think it was, he started to get that hockey stick. But it was it wasn't projections. He was actually all of a sudden doing good things with his business. So of course, I asked, you know, what happened here? You know, what, why all of a sudden are you generating revenue? Um, you must have changed your product. You must have changed your marketing mix hired a new VP of sales, what is it? He said, every single thing is exactly the same about our company. We haven't done anything different since we started. He said, the reason this is, and this is maybe the best answer I can give to your question is, the EMR thing has actually happened. And I thought, that's, that's, an, interesting, that's an interesting observation. But if you think about the healthcare system, the, the, the primary entity of the healthcare system are providers, big health systems, big hospitals, small hospitals, all the way down to the dentist office across the street. And one thing they all did in the last 15 years is replace that giant file cabinet of paper records with electronic medical record systems. The big guys did it multiple times and spent multiple hundreds of millions of dollars doing it on the technology and all the consultants that came in to implement that technology. Most of it didn't work the first time, so then they picked another vendor and they started all over seven years after they started and they went from Cerner to Epic or they went from a no-name to a Athena. Um, if you put yourself in their shoes, if you're a hospital, if you're, the, if you're the CEO of a hospital or the COO or the CTO of a hospital, 
you spent the last 10 or 15 years of your life in kind of EMR hell, hell EMR <laughs> jail, whatever you want to, however you want to describe it. And no matter how compelling Johnny Entrepreneur was when he knocked on your door and said, I've got this great new technology that solves this problem for your hospital. And no matter how much you agree, you don't really take a serious look at that because you weren't going to, you didn't have the, the capacity to be able to take on other technology projects while you were working on the CMR. So I, I don't remember the exact statistic, but well over 90% of healthcare now have their EMR implementations done. So they've taken a big, deep breath, they've patted themselves on the back, and they're ready finally to take on other technology-related uh, products, many of which, and I, this is the, the answer to your question, many of which kind of bolt onto the EMR. The EMR in the healthcare system is the mothership. And now there's now there's something there that a whole bunch of other add-on technologies can take advantage of. They had to wait for the mothership to be installed in the in the healthcare system, and they had to wait for the decision makers to have the bandwidth to, to actually take that sales call in the first place. So we encourage our companies that find us and and I answer the question that you've asked in the way of, you know, thinking about how does the premise that the EMR is up and running impact a new, give, give potential to a new idea, or if you have an idea, how does the fact that that's happened benefit you and, and work that into your story?